Welcome back. Today's sermon is the fourth episode in the series 7, The Churches of Revelation. And our pastor will delve into the church of Pergamos, the compromising church. And now, over to our pastor. It has been leading us. Uh, we've been in the book of Revelation uh, these past um, few weeks. And any, anyone like Revelation? No, it's not your favorite book? You know, I think if you're a singer, a musician, you love psalms. You, you know, if you are a, a, um, maybe evangelist, you love to read the gospels, um, or maybe you love to read the letters sent to the to the uh, uh, sent to the different churches. So the one that Paul actually wrote. Now, Revelation is always interesting because it seems like apocalyptic, and it talks about the end times and all these things. And it's really great to be able to. Find out from the Lord what is it that He wants for your life, or what is it that He is planning to do. Now, the th interesting thing is that if God said I was coming tomorrow, uh, would you be prepared by tomorrow? Uh, wh what would you do differently? If God said at 12:01 p.m. I'm going to return for my people, would you do anything different from now until then? I'm pretty sure all of us would. We would call everybody that, that we're mad at. We'd say, I forgive you. you know, we would, no, we would. We would we, it would change completely the way how we conduct ourselves. Um, but I do want to say is that no man knoweth the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will put in his appearance. And it's not just that. You don't know when your time is going to be up. And so these letters that, that Jesus sent via John to the churches is reminding them about you don't know when the time is going to come where the end is going to be there and I need you to look at these things or fix these things or I need you to be reminded about these things all right so the ser sermon series has been um, is seven and it's the seven churches of revelation uh, I'm going to test you a little bit before we go any further uh, who can tell me the first three churches the letters were sent to without looking in the Bible Ephesus Smyrna, and today, Pergamos, or Pergamum. Um, there, there's two different ways to say it, and so that's the church that we're going to talk about today. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, and stand when you've gotten that, and we're just going to get right into it. So the book of Revelation, chapter 2, I'm going to ask you to stand as we read God's Word. Uh, we'll start reading from verse 12. So once you found it, just say amen. amen. Still looking, say give me a little bit more time, Pastor. I guess everyone's found it, so that's good. So we're going to read in, and just in honor to God's word, and it reads as such. It says, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write this. These are the words of him who has the, what? The sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live. Can, can we say that together? I know where you live. I'm going to pause for a moment. Jesus here was talking to the church. and He says, I know where you live. In other words, I, I know what you're going through. I know what you're experiencing. I know who your neighbor is. I know how you felt when you woke up this morning. I know you're about your backache, your headache, um, your husband ache. I know about all of those things. I know where you live. And he says, not just that. And this is where it got me. You live where Satan has his throne. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> I heard someone say, is he paying rent? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But, but I, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. It says, you did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas or Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Pause there for one. Father, I pray, God, that even as we spend this time in your word, God, that you reveal to us a message that you also sent to the churches. God, we understand and recognize that we are the church. We are the modern church, not a building, but a group of individuals who are committed to obeying and following your laws. God, we just ask, God, that as we are here today, that our ears will be open and we will be a church that hears what thus says the Lord, because you have given us the ear to hear. 
So let us do what doth saith the Lord. Father, we thank you, and we pray, and we say amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. God, but turn to the person next to you. Um, and ask, first of all, I want you to ask them how they're doing. Ask them how they're doing. Let them answer the question. You know, ask them if they had a good week. Ask them if they're hungry. If they're hungry and you got food in your bag, then give them some food. Uh, ask them how they're doing. Um, but, but this is really what I want you to ask them next is, ask them this question. Um, or, or maybe make this statement that God knows where you live. Just turn to somebody else and say, God knows where you live. I don't know if you understand how powerful that statement is. That God knows where you live. God knows where you are. God knows what you are facing. God knows your zip code. He knows who's around you. God knows where you live. Now the, the city of Pergamum, uh, and, and we were talking about these different cities in Asia, and the letter of Revelation, uh, I would say Revelation is a long letter that was broken up in parts. And this particular part was sent to the messenger of the church of Pergamos. Now the messenger of each church was normally the pastor. Um, the pastor was the one that the message was sent to. And so this was the revelation of Jesus that was sent via John's writing to the church of Pergamos. Now Pergamos is an ancient city. It's an old city. It's, uh, um, I'm going to give you some stats. It's about 50 miles from the west coast um, of Asia. It's a little bit further up from, uh, from Ephesus. Uh, it, it wasn't a coastal city, but it was a very important city. And in fact, they said that the city, um, it, it had a lot of wealth, uh, but it also had a lot of Roman influence. It was a wealthy uh, uh, city. It was a political city. Does anyone know about a political wealthy city? Can you think of any cities that are like that today? Uh, it was a city just like them. Um, in fact, there were very educated people there, very learned people there. It, it boasts about having the second greatest library across the time, a rival to uh, the, the library of Alexandria. And so it was an important city. In fact, it was considered to be the capital city of the province. So very successful, important city, but it was a city where Satan lived. Did you, did you get that? It was a city where Satan has his throne. And so when I think of a throne, I think of authority. And so they were living in a place where Christians were under siege and the authority didn't seem to be the Lord. Now, now I want you to understand, I said did not seem to be the Lord. Yet this is how... Jesus opens this passage. He says this, To the angel of the church in Pergamon write this, These are the words of him who has the what? Sharp, double-edged sword. Now why would he write about that to the church? He didn't write about that to the church of Ephesus. He didn't write that to the church of Philadelphia or to the church of Smyrna. But he wrote that to this particular church. And I believe the reason why he wrote that was because of the Roman influence that was evident in the city of Pergamum. Um, the Romans always think about, when you think about those Roman movies and uh, um, um, warriors, that Romans, warriors and soldiers and emperors, they had this short sword that was double-edged. All right. It was a short double-edged sword, and it was a symbol of the Roman power, Roman Empire. You saw somebody with that, you already automatically associated that they have power. So Jesus writes to this church, and he says that I am the one with what? Well, let's change double-edged sword, and let's not find the synonym is power. I am the one with power. I understand that you live in a city where the Romans seem to have power. I understand you live in a city where they have all these temples to the emperors and temples to Zeus and temples to Dionysus and all these other gods. But I write to you today because I truly am the one with power. How many of you know that God is the one that really has the power? It may seem that those in government have power. It may seem like your manager can fire you or not fire you. But can I tell 
tell you, if God says no, it doesn't matter who your boss is. They can't let you go. God is the ultimate one with the power. And I think sometimes we forget that we serve a mighty God. We tremble and we worry and we wonder what are we going to do. But you need to be able to tell your doctor, tell your auntie, tell your neighbor that God is the one with the power. And so Jesus opens this letter with that assertion that I'm the one with the double-edged sword. I'm the one with the power. I understand that you live in a city that is not, I would say, kind to believers. I, I understand that you live in a city where the throne seems to be Satan is sitting on, but I am the one with the power. And he goes on and he, and he continues and he opens up with this encouragement. I, I know where you live. I, I, I know what you've been through in life. I know when you were homeless. I know when everybody turned their back on you and it was you alone. I, I know those times that you were pressed at work, pressed in school. I, I know when you almost gave up. I, I even know when you were at the edge of the bridge and you were about to jump, but something pulled. I know about those moments, the darkest, deepest moments. In your, I know where you live. Now, I don't know if you've ever been asked by a stranger, so where do you live? Have you ever been asked that question? Now, some advice, especially if you've ev never done this or if you've done this before. You may tell them your city, but you don't tell them your whole address. Is that right? You don't tell them, well, I live on 1414 East 48th Street, you know, second floor, second apartment. In fact, the key is underneath the mat, you know. <laughs> You don't give strangers information about where you live. So God is not a stranger and he knows where you live. He, he knows, and, and, and the th thing about especially um, visitors at home, if you've ever gotten, a, have you ever gotten somebody that, that knocked on your door and you wasn't expecting them? Well, who's ever, who likes unexpected visitors? <laughs> Nobody. Can I, one of the reasons why we don't like unexpected visitors is because sometimes, you know, let's be real, our home is not really the way how we want it to, you know, we may have some stuff over here, and, and so all of a sudden, you know, you, you see somebody at the door, and, you, and you, you already know who it is, you're like, who is it? <laughs> all right, and, and then you're like, I'm coming, and then while you're doing it, you're grabbing the stuff, you're throwing it in the closet, you're throwing it in the couch, because you want it to be presentable. You don't want everybody and anybody coming to where you live. Because where you live is your place of safety, but it's also your, your place where you're most vulnerable. Amen. It's where your precious things are. It's often where your secrets live. It's where you, you spend time, uh, um, and, and not everybody knows. For, for some of you ladies, that's where you put your hair up in those rollers, and you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and, and so forth. That used to bother me when I, you know, my sisters, they had the rollers and they wrap it and so forth. And, you know, it used to bother me. It's like, oh man, what is that? You know, or, or, or the mask, you know, the mask that they put on before they go to bed and, like, and you wake up like, whoa, who is that? And so forth. Uh, but, see, but in your home, you're in this space where, where you're, you're in your natural and setting and environment and you can kind of do what you want to do. But God knows where you live. God knows about your vulnerabilities, your secrets, but all, God also knows about your pain. And so we have the, the church of Pergamos, which was birthed um, during Paul's travels, and here they're finding themselves under a great deal of stress, and they're being forced to do this thing, I'm going to use this word, called compromise. Compromise. Does anyone know what compromise means? Is it possible that a believer can compromise their faith? Is it possible that a person who loves God, a child of God, can be put in situations where they have to lie? Is it possible that even where you work, is it possible that, you know, on that application, you leave out some things and, because you feel that you don't want to look in any way bad, so you don't fill in everything correctly. Friends, I tell you today that the enemy wants us to compromise our morals and compromise our faith. That's what he wants. He wants us to 
uh, go to a church where we start doing church the way how we want to do church. That we allow anything and everything, anybody, and, and understand what I mean by allow. Our leaders are obligated to operate at a higher level than the sheep. You have to hold me accountable to the word of God. If I'm speaking anything that is contrary to this book, then I am compromising the gospel. All right? And in today's times, it seems like uh, the gospel is being given out to the highest bidder. In fact, I've seen where um, blessings are given out based upon the currency that you provide. That if you provide a certain amount of currency, then I'm going to exchange it for a blessing. Compromising the gospel. And, and Jesus was warning them, don't compromise your faith. Don't be like Balaam and Balak. Don't compromise your faith. Now, you may be wondering, well, who's Balaam? If you read the text a little further, and I'm just wrapping this up, you know, Balaam was a, a prophet or soothsayer. Um, this was during the times of Israel's uh, journey or exodus, and, and his story is told in the book of Numbers. Numbers, I believe, chapter 22. And it talks about this man where there was a king that was scared of the Israelites, and he said, I need to find a way to get over them. And he, and he consults his advisor. And they said, there's a man who can speak against any nation. And his name was Balaam. The king Balak sent his advisors and his top officials. And he sent them with money to go to who? To Balaam to say, hey, can, I, I need you to speak against the people of God. Now what Balaam did, which was was really horrible, he entertained the finance. Even though he said no immediately, or, or I would say within that next day, he first entertained it because he was actually compromising the gospel. He, 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 essentially, he was saying, my prophecy is up for sale. I'll prophesy things, you know, as long as you can give me enough money. Now, isn't that the state of the church today? Isn't that what we're seeing happening is that we're propagating the gospel as it's a currency. Now, now, now if, it, if, if you give enough, then I will give you what you want. Th that's not what the word of God says. And, and so um, um, Jesus was cautioning the church. He was saying, church, I love you. I, mean, I, I see that you have been even in the middle of uh, an area, a city, which there's emperor worship and all these types of things. You, you're doing good, but don't dare compromise your morals or your faith. I, I think that for many of us, um, we all encounter scenarios where the enemy wants us to bow. One of my favorite Old Testament stories is of the three Hebrew boys. And this is a story which puts them in a position where they can either compromise what they believe or they can stand up for what they believe. I'm not going to assume that you know the story, but the story is told of these three Hebrew boys that um, after um, the, the, the land was conquered, they were taken to Babylon. The king at the time... Of Babylon, the ruler was King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and they were there, they were part of the brightest, they were part of the smartest, they were young, sharp, good looking, they were taken from their land as slaves. And they would say, Well, we're going to um, raise them to be the rulers of our nation. And so they brought these young men and some others, and Daniel was also connected with this group. And there was this time that the king you know, was, was built up this huge um, altar for himself. And, and um, some of the, there was some jealousy amongst those that didn't like these three Hebrew boys. And so they say, you know what, uh, um, we're going to find a way to destroy them. And it also reminds me of something that happened um, with, with, uh, with Daniel. Can I tell you that when you're living for God, there's going to always be someone that wants to destroy you. Not everyone's going to like it. Uh, there's going to be some people that will try to pull you down. But essentially, it's like when the music plays, everyone in the nation should bow to who? To false gods, bow to idols. And remember what I told you about Pergamos, it was a, a nation or city that 
there was a lot of idol worship. In fact, they had three, three temples for emperors. They had the temple of Zeus as well, the temple of Dionysus or Dinah. They had uh, multiple temples that they were worshiping everything else, which is why I believe the word describes it, that this literally was the place where their throne, Satan, was sitting on. But the story of the three Hebrew boys continues, and if you recall, uh, that the music starts playing, and they make a decision to not compromise their beliefs. So they could have easily said, well, you know, I'm not going to bow up, but I'm just going to tie my laces. <laughs> Have we ever kind of done something like that? You know, that, uh, well, I'm not going to exactly, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want anyone else to see me pray. So we do this thing at the, uh, we go out to lunch and we go. And in that moment, you said a prayer. But I, can I tell you, you're, you're compromising your faith. Be proud of who you are. Be bold. Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for truth. We cannot be a church that allows any and anything just because the world thinks it's popular. We can't compromise our morals of what we believe. And so the three Hebrew boys, as the story continues, the music starts playing, and everyone else seems to bow based upon the king's command. And we find that they dare not bow to a king that is not the true and living king. There were repercussions. You know, people saw them and said, wait, those boys didn't bow. Bring them here. And they brought them and uh, the king gave them another chance. I said, I'm going to let you try it again. Maybe you didn't understand my instructions. Maybe you were confused. Maybe the language I'm speaking you don't understand. And they gave them another chance and they refused to bow and they were, of course, cast, tied, and cast into the furnace, which was heated seven times hotter than normal. So hot that those who threw them into the furnace, that what happened? That they would die because of the immense heat. And, and, and in the middle of the furnace was something, it, it, I would say it's called the fourth man. Because there were three that were thrown into the fire. But all of a sudden, the, the, the king says, but I see a fourth man. I, I, I see something that looks like us, the son of God. I, can I tell you, even when you don't compromise, there will always be a fourth man. There will always be a miracle. Even in the midst of you feeling that you are going to be damaged or hurt or offended. Can I tell you, that God will always show up for his children. For those who don't compromise on the gospel. Stand for the right and God will always stand for you always yet we've become a church today that will allow anything and everything Jesus gives some some promises to those who respond and turn and are victorious of situations which would not cause them, but which would perhaps tempt them to compromise. He gives, he tells them, this is what will happen. It's, th there is a result for those who are victorious but can I tell you there is also a result for those who allow themselves to stay in the place where he's warned if you've ever warned somebody off oh, don't go don't go there because if you go there you'll find trouble and yet they still seem to go there guess what they find they find trouble and Jesus is is admonishing the church today is that as you think about your decisions, your life, you know, your, yourself in the marketplace, it's really saying don't compromise who you are just because it's unpopular for your organizational culture. It is not popular for you to be in corporate America and for you to say that you love God. It's not popular. It's not popular for you to be um, at the water cooler where everyone gathered and they're gossiping about someone and you maybe say, you know what, we probably shouldn't do that. It's not popular. You know what's popular? It's so easy to get along with the bandwagon. 
it's e- it is easier just to, just to sit back and just, I, I guess that's just the way how, no, that's not just the way how it is. That's not the way how we're supposed to treat people. That is not, we're not supposed to allow any and everything. All right, just because the world wants it to be in the church doesn't mean we embrace it in the church. We love everybody in the church, but we don't accept anything and everything in the church. We cannot compromise who we are just because the government makes a law or makes a suggestion. Can I, the church has to be the church, all right? And, and it doesn't matter who's on the throne who's in, in the government I, I, gotta tr- I gotta believe that no matter what the enemy says that God is the ultimate one who has the double edged sword he's the one with the power he's the one with the glory he's the one with all that we need and so we cannot afford to compromise who we are just because it's easier the church of, of Pergamum, as I mentioned, is one that I, I truly celebrate as I think about what they had to face on a daily life. If I was part of that church, I would have been walking through the city and I would have seen you know, altars that were made for um, worship of other idols. It would have been a common practice. Um, I would have been introduced to um, prostitutes on the streets. In fact, they said that there probably was about 30,000 registered prostitutes. Now, notice what I said. Registered on the job application where you work. What's your profession? It was a profession. And there was about 30,000 more that were unregistered. I'm telling you that that's what you would have been exposed to. And there are going to be some... There are going to be some things that you're exposed to that is going to be very hard for you to overcome. But I challenge you today that it's it's especially in those moments that you you, you dig down deep. You you bury your ankles into into the rock and you shall not be moved. Don't be moved just because the wind is blowing from the opposite direction. Don't be moved just because it feels like the easy thing to do. We cannot compromise our faith or our morals. And I'm going to leave you with this this afternoon. Because here's the promise. The promise for the one who does not, uh, they will receive my adversarial position with me with a sword of my mouth and so he says repent therefore otherwise this is what will happen I will come against you he's not talking about the sinners he's not even talking about against the enemy he's talking about against the church that if you don't repent that I will come against you. There's some times that you're facing stagnancy in your life because literally God has positioned himself against you because you're living what is called a Christian life only by name, not by character. That you've allowed certain things and certain habits to be in your life. They've crept in. They've taken up an address. And yes, I understand God knows where you live, but it doesn't mean you have to still stay there. But whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And this is the promise. I love promises. I I, I love the promises. It's it's these if-then statements. Well, if you do this, then I will do that. He said, to the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. This, this last part is interpreted in a few different ways, but if you recall, I mentioned that the city of Pergamos was host to one of the greatest libraries in the ancient world. And libraries were a, a thing of culture. It, was, it wasn't like the libraries here. You can't just take a library card and go and take out a parchment or papyrus. And if you had a book, you were one of the wealthiest persons, so most of the reading material wasn't available to the general public unless you went to this library. And um, the, the actual name parchment comes from the word Pergamos. 
and it's named as such because this was such a, an extraordinary place of teaching and learning. And so they used to write on, on parchment or, you know, that, that's what they used to ascribe. And so instead, there was no printing press. So if we wanted to have a copy of a book, we had to pay somebody to personally rewrite what was written somewhere else. Now all of those books at this time, um, we don't know what happened to that library. I can't tell you. All the material maybe has withered away and it no longer can be read about. We only talk about in Asian history. But I love what it says about the name. To the one who is victorious, I'll give that person a white stone with a new name written on it. Friends, I want to remind you of this, that when we can be victorious over the sin of compromise, our name is not written on parchment. Our name is not written on a whiteboard or on chalkboard. Our name is etched in a stone which is foundational. You have to understand the difference and I believe that it ends this way because they understood about the writings and how writings can be temporary. But if for those who are victorious, I'll write a new name on a stone that cannot be crushed. Not only to the one who receives it. Would you bow your heads with me? Friends, I want you to be victorious over this easy thing called compromise. And we do it so often that sometimes we don't even realize that it's a sin. We fudge the numbers. We're not fully honest or open. We allow a little bit of too much when God says, no, not in my house, not for my people, not for my children. We take a sip when you know God has told you not to take even a sip. It's called compromise. God says, don't go there. When we start to take, well, I'm only going to take two steps. Compromise. Not for this church. Not for this house. So we had the opportunity today to remind the church about God's desire that we no longer be a church that compromises. We don't compromise what we believe. We don't compromise what we stand for. That we have to be the church. I want to encourage you this day that you consider in your own life, that you'll make sure that you don't make any room for compromise in the marketplace. Um, if you're a student at school, uh, if you are in, uh, employed on, on the workplace, make no room for compromise. Father, I pray God that your hand will be upon your sons and daughters, that we will be the church that you envisioned church without compromise, a church who loves the way how we should love, a church who stands up for truth and righteous regardless of the adversaries against us. Amen. God bless you. I want to thank you again for partnering with our ministry and we ask that you continue to keep us in prayer. If you do need uh, someone to pray with you, just get in touch with us uh, at the information on the screen below. God bless you and we look forward to talking with you soon.